get to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. And also, I'm going to let you do this. I'm going to let you go back and grab the book of Amos. Amos will be right after Joel. Amos will not have fingerprints on it. I know y'all haven't studied Amos this week. But grab Amos and chapter 3 when you get there and go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4 is where we've been. Right after Joel. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put on the board here the premise of what we've been talking about. We've been talking about walking worthy. And we've done a series of messages now over the last little while about walking worthy. And we put three principles on the board, actually four. We've got doctrine, which is what a lot of people throw out in order to have a large assembly. Throw out the doctrine, don't get down into that stuff, and you can draw a crowd, right? Just tell them about Jesus, right? Tell them about how to love your neighbor and all that business. And we should. But what about loving your neighbor gets contrary to the Word of God? What happens? Yeah. Right? So then we talk about doctrine. And we talk about knowledge. And we talk about understanding. And you say, well, those two things are the same. Not exactly. No. Knowledge is teaching or excuse me, doctrine is teaching. Knowledge is illuminating the mind by learning. Understanding is the comprehension of that. Remember, we've said that. Of course, the fourth, the fourth thing that we, that we need to put on here is application. So as we study today, I, wanna, I want you to see that. Uh, I thought today would be the last of these messages. It will not be because I can't get through them all. I can't get through all the, the verses. Actually, I probably won't get past one verse, maybe two. But we're going to do that. Okay, go with me to the book of Ephesians in chapter 4. Look at verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called, <clears throat> with all lowliness, meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, even as you are called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given the grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to get up and work through Part of verse 4, we won't get them all done. I'm not going to go through all the ones. There's seven points of unity there, and we're not going to get through all of them. Okay, But what we're going to discuss, as we have been, is walking worthy. Right? This is walking worthy. <coughs> part 4, I think. Now, if you haven't seen the other, been here, or seen the other videos, then you probably need to go back and get that to kind of catch up where we're at. Because we talked about the Word of God. We talked about being strong in the Lord. We talked about the whole armor of God, how it was the armor of light. And then last week, we expounded some more on our walk. Today, what we really want to talk about is kind of what we have been conversing about before we come on camera. It's about our fellowship together. It's about what our walk really means. What is the purpose of our walk? When you hear this today, if you've spent time in a denominational church, a religious venue, if you will, this walk is going to make more sense to you. You're going to understand and you're going to have some life experiences to go, I remember that, okay? And you're going to be able to, you're going to be able to understand more about the purpose of, of what Christ has done for us, who we are in Christ, what we have in Christ, okay? You're going to have this understanding to now what the walk really is for and what it really is about, okay? So we've done a lot of study. So what I want you to do 
is go back here to the book of Amos with me. And chapter 3, we just want to look at one verse there. Look at verse 3, chapter 3, verse 3. Can two walk together except they be what? Agreed. What I have taught you over the last four weeks, of course, way longer than that, but in this series of messages, is how important doctrine is. How important learning correct doctrine is. How important it is to comprehend correct doctrine. And then applying that to your walk. Alright? Because there's an overall purpose in Ephesians 4 about your walk. And the overall purpose is not so that you can push your chest out and look at people in your neighborhood and say, well, I'm glad I don't do what they do. And you look at the people that you go to church with and say, I'm glad I'm better than they are. I heard Steve Atwood, in a message that he taught, he preached, his mentor made a statement years ago that if you believe that you're better than everybody else or anybody else, you might not be saved. Now, I hate to tie anything to somebody's salvation, but there's some wisdom in that. If you think you're better than somebody else, how good do you think you really are, right? Do you think you didn't really need a Savior, or do you really realize how broken your flesh was? And that's what the man was trying to say. Nobody in this room, outside of this room, should look at anybody else and say, I'm better than that, right? Because we all are what? Sinners to the flesh. We learned that last week when we talked about the, the spirit and the flesh. So you never need to do that to have that mindset of what you are. Only brag about who you are in Christ. And it all goes back to Christ, right? Because religion's going to get you to focus on that. It's going to get you to focus on the outward man so that you can, you can boast about what you're doing and what everybody else is not doing. What grace is going to do, the Spirit is going to lead you to praise the Lord for everything that He's done for you through His Son, Jesus Christ, and what you have and who you are in Him. From there, grace is going to teach you how to walk worthy of your calling, right? So go with me here and look at uh, verse 2 and 3 in Ephesians 4. And he starts to talk about, well, look at the, the one that we've been dealing with. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. So there's a vocation in that verse and there's a calling in that verse, right? All right, now look at verse 2. With all lowliness, meekness, and long suffering, forbearing one another in love. That's where sometimes we want to skip that and go to the next verses because we're not always good at that stuff, right? So this is obviously to me, it's talking about the church. It's talking about the body. That we should walk in lowness and meekness, not weakness, but meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. It's not talking about the world here. This walk that we have and what the writer and what God has inspired the writer to put on paper is our walk with one another. It's our walk toward each other, okay? That, that's the crucial thing for you to understand. This is to the church, the body of Christ. Watch what he says in verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In order to keep something, you must already have it, right? So we have the Spirit. Now, Everybody here agrees we have the Spirit, right? If you're saved, you have the Spirit. What does it say in Romans? Romans chapter 8. There's people who teach you that you don't get the Holy Ghost till sometime later after you get saved, after you've cleaned up your flesh and all that. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's what they teach, right? You get the Spirit the very moment you believe. <laughs> You get spirit. Look here in chapter 8 and verse 8. We looked at this last week. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is what? He is none of his. So the Bible says we want to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. How are you going to do that? Correct doctrine, knowledge, understanding, application. 
when we come in here together, we're what? We're in unity. Why? Because we've seen some things. We have the light in mind. We believe the gospel that Jesus died for our sins, was buried, rose again for our justification. We don't add one thing to that. We take nothing away from that. I would say, and I would hope that everybody in this room agrees with that. That's unity. Right? We all agree in this room that Jesus Christ needs to be preached according to Paul's gospel and the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Can we all agree on that? That's unity. That is endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Because you know what the Spirit knows? That Jesus should be preached according to Paul's gospel, right? And the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret since the world began. That's what the Spirit is doing today. You have a different administration of the Spirit than the dispensation of the grace of God than what you had back on the little flock in early Acts and so forth. But where are most people stuck in early Acts? If they've even made it to early Acts. Some of them are still stuck in the four Gospels. They can't get out of there. Then what some say is, well, no, we believe the full Gospel. We don't just take the four. We move over into Acts. The full Gospel today, folks, is how Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. That's the full Gospel. You can't get any fuller than that. All right? So the unity of the Spirit. So let's just say, Let's disturb the spirit a little bit. Let's grieve him. How are you going to grieve him? Come in here. Brother Randy's going to stand up and say, well, I'll just tell you one thing. I don't believe that's the gospel. I believe you got to get wet. You see where we're headed? Yeah. Now, what needs to happen? I get Randy, lead him out the arm, tell him don't ever, no. I need to sit down with him. I need to give him a gentle rebuke and say, Randy, look at the scripture right here. What does this Bible say? What is, and I need to talk with Randy. We need to converse until we both are right according to the Word of God. And I don't bang him over the head. Now, what if Randy wants to continue that thought process and drag that in here Sunday in and Sunday out? What needs to happen? Now there comes a separating point. There comes a place to where you have to say, Randy, you need to get a church that preaches getting wet to be saved. Because we can't, at some point, you have to separate so we can't have people dragging doctrine in here, getting us off course to what we've studied and what we've seen. Don't mean we know everything, okay? But we know it's bad doctrine, it's bad doctrine. We can't allow that to infiltrate what God has given us to be stewards of. We have to continue with the message. We have to continue with the doctrine that we have been taught, that we have knowledge of understanding and application. Doesn't mean we're not going to learn. We're going to learn more as we go, right? We all are in a learning deal. We'll forever be learning here, okay? And I'm not so sure we won't forever be learning in eternity. <laughs> you know, I truly believe you can't. God's God, folks. If you could understand God, that would strip Him of being God, right? He wouldn't be God. I can't understand my wife. And here I'm going to figure out God? Really? Help me. Amen? The unity of the Spirit. Look at 1 Corinthians and chapter 6. Endeavoring. Now this walk, we haven't left this walk because really this is what the walk is going to come down to. It's going to come down to our fellowship. It's going to come down to how we walk, how we treat each other. Then what's going to happen is there's going to be a product that the Spirit breathes out of that that's going to be effective. Because he works from the inside out in the dispensation of the grace of God. You're going to see that grace life bubble up and it's going to go out and it's going to, it's going to affect the ministry that God has given us. Anybody here know what our calling is? Most people say, well, we need to go all the world and baptize one. No, folks, you've been called to what? To be an ambassador. An ambassador of God's grace, an ambassador of Christ, an ambassador. You, that's your calling. Don't lose focus of that. Okay? You, you don't have this spare special anointing where you're going to take the, the, the Pope position of the Bible. God has called us all to be ambassadors of His grace. Okay? And of His Son. Plain and simple, that's your calling. Now how is that going to happen if you don't know correct doctrine, you don't have the knowledge, you don't have the understanding, and you don't apply it. It will not. And that's where we started with this whole walk. There's people who go in these verses, and they want to look brilliant, and they absolutely end up complicating the Bible for you. 
I don't want that for you. I want it to be simple enough to where it's applicable. If, if, you, if it's trigonometry, most of us are going to miss it, yeah. right? But if it's laid out for you in practical teaching according to God's Word, you can receive it, you can apply it, and you can begin to live it. It lives through you. That's what Paul taught. Okay, look at 1 Corinthians 6. And look down at verse 17. But he that is joined unto the Lord is what? One spirit. There's a spirit of unity there, right? So here we have the Lord. Where were you joined unto the Lord at? As he was walking Galilee? No. Where? When you believed, and where is he at? Oh, that's a great teaching. In heaven. Where are you seated? In Christ. But where are you at? You're down here, right? I know I can look heavenly, folks, sometimes, but I'm not there yet. Spiritually speaking, I am. That's a joke. Y'all kind of laugh right there. All right. So the Bible teaches me that I've been joined to the Lord. And because I've been joined to the Lord, I'm what? I'm one spirit with Him. So not only am I seated in Christ in heavenly places, but Christ is in me, which is what? The hope of glory. So therefore, we can take fallen flesh, and as Paul is going to show us in the book of Philippians, and we can begin to strive to the mark of what? A higher calling. How much higher can you get than heaven and in Jesus Christ? Right? So what Paul is really saying in that verse is broken earthly flesh can strive for the mark of a higher calling. A heavenly calling. Not an earthly walk to worry about how many cars I've got and how much food I've got and how I impress my neighbors and what my clothes look like constantly and all that stuff. And look, folks, if you got it, you got it. Live with it, all right? But I'm telling you that earthly walk, Paul says, I'm putting that behind me. I'm going to count every bit of that stuff dung, right? That I may walk and strive to the mark of the higher calling, which is in heaven. The conversation, all of it's in heaven, and that's the walk that we should have. Now, when we have that mindset one among another, you know what it does for us? It gets our eyes off of the brother and sister, and it puts it on Christ. Right? There's so many people that are consumed with their own flesh and their brother and sister's flesh that they can't see Christ. And they haven't been taught the Christ that's ascended, the head of the church. They've been taught Christ after the flesh. Right? And so therefore they teach Jesus how? Fleshly. And that bothers them when you say that, but that's true. Should we not... Go back here and study those books and learn those books. Absolutely, folks. When you get the real doctrine out of those books, it's amazing how dumb it'll make your old pastor look. Okay? He used them to tell stories. There's doctrine in those books. Okay? There's real doctrine in those books. It's not a fairy tale. Right? It's not so he can get up and twist it and make a good sermon and the guy behind him twist it and put a good sermon out. There's true doctrine in those books. The Bible is good. For doctrine, reproof, correction, right? It's all inspired. But you need to understand sound doctrine for today. Okay? And that's going to be found in your apostles' writing. I was reading back in Ephesians 6, or 4 and 6, 5 and 6. He said there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And it hit my mind. I do believe, I honestly believe, if he'd have added, and one apostle to the church, the body of Christ, men would have still doubted it. They still would reject it. They've rejected the one Lord, the risen Savior. They've rejected the one baptism. Right? How are you going to keep unity of the Spirit and doctrine if everybody comes in here and everybody's got a different way to be baptized? Well, I believe you've got to be dunked in a tank. Well, I believe it's got to be in a muddy river. I believe it's got to be forward. I believe it's got to be backwards. I believe it's got to be sprinkling. I believe it's got to be with a garden hose. I believe you got to do it until you begin to choke. I had a lady to tell me that. I taught a message not far from here and she got done. She goes, I think some of those pastors ought to hold them down there a little longer. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the arms start flopping. <laughs> really? 
That'll help them. Y'all think I'm kidding. That happened. That ha and I said, well, ma'am, that wasn't really the baptism that I was speaking of. I was speaking of this baptism. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're talking about the unity of the Spirit here. We're talking about walking together. How can two walk together except they be agreed? See, what you have in these assemblies who don't have this unity of the Spirit, they don't know this doctrine that Paul has laid out. You've got divisions. And you get cliques in the church. Churches shouldn't have cliques. We're a body, man. We got to love each other. Hey, the weakest to the strongest and everything in between, we've got to be about loving each other in the Lord the right way. So look here in 1 Corinthians in 12. For as the body is what? One. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. For as the body is one and have many members. So you see that it's one body, but there's many people in that body, right? And all the members of that one body being many are what? One body. So also is Christ. Is Christ divided into denominations? Is Christ divided in how you want to be baptized? Right? He's not. He's not. Christ is one and the body is one with Christ. So you better get the doctrine right. Including baptism. And I'm not here to get on to baptism this morning, but you got to handle the scriptures, right? So look at verse 13. For by how many spirits? By one. Are we all baptized where? Into one body. Now notice, doesn't matter who we are in the flesh, right? Because he's going to baptize into that body the believers, and it don't matter if they're Jews or Gentiles, whether they be bond or free, and have been all made to drink what? Into what? One spirit. The unity of the spirit. When you begin to see the unity of the Spirit, we begin to walk in the unity of the Spirit. We begin to see what the verses say when you rightly divide the Word of God. It brings unity to the body. What has happened to the body? Those even who are saved. They've been divided up, man. If I don't agree with you on baptism, I'm going to go start me another program. That's how you've got all those denominations out there. And they're persuaded somehow that God has signed off on their denomination. Well, we're the closest thing to the truth. Who wants to be close to the truth? I want the truth. I want to be close. That's horseshoes. Right? Throw a horseshoe, you get a point for being close, man. I don't want to be close. I want a ringer. I want the truth. And the truth comes when you're right to divide the word of truth. Right? You can have this thing and be truth and not almost truth. You know, you know what a lie is? Partial truth in some cases. Some has none. Right? You can tell, you know, that people always measure lies, you know, little, big one. Lies a lie, right? So when you start to see this unity of the Spirit, look at Galatians chapter 6. Now watch, watch it, you know, going back to how we're supposed to walk with meekness and long-suffering. Watch how he, he says here, deal. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of what? Meekness. Considering thyself, lest thou also be what? Tempted. I know of a lady, and it's been years ago, and I can tell this story without her knowing who she is. Her husband left her for another woman. She's in a church, and you know what they told her? You have to come off the membership roll. You can't be a member here. She said, why? She said, because your husband left you. Really? So I'm on your prestigious member roll, but I can't be a member because my husband left me for another woman, and I have to come off your membership roll. But you know what they would do for her and do with her? She, she could still tithe. She could still pay to have a lie shot down her throat every week, but she just couldn't be on the membership roll. You know what they'd have seen of me? My brake lights heading for the driveway. Yeah, I'd have jumped the curb getting out of there. That's how bogus, that's how blinding, that's how superficial that stuff outside 
in those churches, that's how it is. What does the Bible say here? He said, restore such one. Those who are spiritual, what does that mean? Those who have sound doctrine, they have the knowledge, understanding, and they've applied it. Let them work with those. Unless, hey, listen, consider yourself because you could fall also. You ever thought about that? When you hear, I, I, I remember watching that stuff, and I'm not here to tell stories this morning, but I mean watching that stuff in, in church in years past, my history past, somebody get out in a little bit of trouble, and the thing was, was what? Let's talk about them. Let's talk about them. Let's put them down a little further. And the Bible says don't do that. Try to restore that person in, in, in meekness and so forth. Try to help that person. Now, it comes time when you have to sometimes draw a line in the sand and say we can't have that. Okay, you, you, we can't accept that. We can't, you know, that can't be. But folks, we ought to take the first route and try to establish that person and get that person turned around. We're thinking about ourselves, what if it were me? What if it were my family? What if it, you have to think about those things? Because church, in most circles, is the most judgmental place that you'll visit. All right? Most judgmental place that you'll visit. Look with me back over in Philippians. Watch what Paul does here by inspiration of the Holy Spirit on how this assembly, when we walk in the unity of the Spirit, how we are going to operate and how we're going to operate together. Even though we be many members, we're going to operate as one body. Watch what Paul does, 1 and 27 of Philippians. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. That you stand fast, where? One spirit. With one mind, striving, what? Together for the faith of what? Our number one calling, folks. Do whatever you want to do. Get your message from whoever you want it. Your number one calling in this Christian walk, in this life, is the gospel. That's the best thing you can give anybody. There's a social gospel out there in denominational circles, and it's about feeding people physical food. I'm not against that. Don't say I am. All right? But if I don't give them the gospel, I can get them as fat as a Christmas turkey and never, hurt, never help them, right? They have to have that gospel. That's the thing that's going to last forever. You can die and go to hell on a full gut, right? You need the gospel. And that's our number one calling is to teach people what saith the gospel. What is it about? What do I believe? Right? It's the gospel. So Paul states it there that we strive together in the unity of the Spirit to speak the same thing and let our conversation be a what? Concerning the gospel. The gospel is quoted in this building more every Sunday than it is in all the buildings around us Amen. probably in 30, 40 years. And yet people are sitting there with no clue about who they are and where they are. Some not saved, unfortunately. The lights have never been turned on because it has not been taught. All right? So this walk of ours is about how we walk together. Go back to Ephesians in chapter 2. Talking about the Spirit here. Think about this. Some of us in life have been on teams. We sports, whatever the case may be. And I once had a coach to tell me, he said, Mr. Holt, he said, let me, let me get something into your head. I was like, all right, what's that? He said, one man is not going to pull us to victory. It's going to take a team. He said, but you know what? One man can keep us from victory if he don't play team ball. Well, the body of Christ is not about one person being the superstar. Not about one person being over your faith as they do in denominational churches. The body of Christ is about every member having its proper place and working together. Right? So that we can accomplish what it is that God is doing today. 
ambassadors of God's grace, given the gospel. So there's more to that list, by the way, and I'll show it to you as we go. Look here in 2.18 of Ephesians. For through Him, that's Jesus Christ, we both have access by what? One Spirit unto the Father. Have you ever met the person, and this, this bothers me, don't take this the wrong way. So and so sick, you mind coming over and praying for him? Why can't you? That verse just said, for through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. I've got no more access than you do. Me coming and standing over somebody, putting my hand on their head, folks, it's a waste of fuel. Now, to pray for them, hallelujah, I pray for them. Well, you might just have the power to raise them up. If I had that power, I'd be at Brenner's this morning, raising up little children. Well, my heart goes out to children, right? I'd, I'd, bless God, I'd be lifting them up. God had to stop me. He goes, Donnie, you done healed too many people. Stop, please. You had to stop that, because I'd be down there raising them children up. My wife and I were sitting not long ago, and I mean, this is a storytelling morning. And we were sitting not too long ago having our lunch outside at our favorite place. I'm not going to tell y'all where that's at because y'all might show up. <laughs> but we were sitting there having our lunch. Yeah. And this fella gets out of his car and blesses his heart. His body was all just twisted up. And, you know, you could tell, you know, he had some serious issues. And he got within just a couple feet of me, and I said, how you doing today, sir? He didn't stop and say, well, I wish you would look at me and think about how bad I got life. He looked at me and goes, I'm blessed. He said, I'm doing great. And the tears started to wipe up my eyes about that man. I said, praise God, listen to that. She looked over at me and she goes, what's wrong with you? And I'm sitting there and I'm crying because of what that man had to say. He's praising God and he's not, he's too blessed to be depressed. That's right. Yeah. And then, Another one come through pushing a child that was in a, an older child in like a stroller because that child couldn't walk. And the tears wept up my eyes to think about these men who claim they got healing power. And that child is in that condition. Folks, we all have access by one spirit. We don't have a special person in the church that's specially anointed to do special things. There was a time past when God worked that way. There's a time future when God's going to work that way. But right now, during the dispensation of the grace of God, we all have the calling to be ambassadors and to give the gospel. All right? Go with me back to Ephesians, where we started this morning, Ephesians 4. And we'll start to try to put a bow on this. We'll have to continue with another message. This one we're going to have to talk about just a little bit because the church world and the world in general just don't understand. They have it wrong. Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. We just discussed all that. What the Spirit is doing today is what we ought to be doing, right? The gospel, knowledge, doctrine, understanding, see all men say, come to the knowledge of truth, study the Bible, rightly divide the Bible. That's what the Spirit's wanting us to do, what He would have us to do. When we don't do that, we grieve the Spirit. Okay? We grieve the Spirit by going back into a time past doctrine and doing opposite of what He's doing. Does it grieve you? When all of us who've had children, you want them to do a certain thing, they go do another thing, it grieves you, don't it? It bothers you. I didn't raise you that way. I didn't teach you that. Down deep. <laughs> he just got it from you. See, the worst problem my son's got is I'm his dad. Right? Just worst, don't laugh, your children got the same problem. <laughs> don't y'all look at me with your halo all crooked on your horns. You got the same problem. Your kids got the same simple flesh that I got, right? Yeah. So worst problem he's got is I'm his dad. See? So when a flat when, when, as I heard one brother say, don't 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 y'all get too high on the on the cow because uh, your your child's gonna be like the devil too, and, and he gonna need salvation, right? That's what it's all about, man. You, you better understand this old flesh of ours is fallen. So watch what he says here. They're endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, what? In the bond of peace. How does the world view peace? Notice he's telling us to keep 
the unity of the Spirit. Keep it in the bond of peace. The world thinks peace is what? Everybody gets along. And we just throw away that cuss word right there. They hate that word because we're not going to all get along if we go to doctrine. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to put blue flashing lights in here. We're going to throw the curtains back. We're going to get us a rock group to come in. And we're going to get juiced up in the flesh. And we're not going to talk about doctrine. What we're going to do, we're going to talk about jitterbug Jesus and how I can get you high on religion today. And we're going to build this thing up. Well, that's the answer if you want to fill it up. Right? That's the answer. I've been there, folks, and did that. And there was a part of it I enjoyed. Yeah. Huh? There was times when I wanted to jump a pew, man. I thought it was the Holy Spirit. You know what it was? Flesh. My nasty flesh. Getting all juiced up in something I like. When the drum started. Right? Hey, I went to churches as a kid. The electric guitar would start, the drums would start, and the dancing would start. You know what would happen? The guitar stopped. The dancing stopped. It wasn't the Spirit of God. It was the guitar. Right? They just like me on a Saturday when I was out in the world, man. They like music. Music could do you that way. You know, that's what one brother said when the devil got cast out of heaven, he fell into the choir. He juiced up the music for him when he got there. I'll get y'all blind in this music, man. I'll get y'all all wrapped up in that stuff. And you won't worry about doctrine, knowledge, and understanding. You'll just go in and have your good old party every Sunday and you'll leave there you know, and you act like I'm against music. Man, I love music. But listen, you can't replace doctrine, knowledge, understanding, and application with music. You've got to be careful with that thing called music because the devil is a musician. If you don't believe it, turn the radio on. He'll sing to you highway to hell. Right? You've got to be careful with that business. I'm telling you, that's not what the Spirit is doing. What the Spirit wants you to know is doctrine. And He wants you to follow it and walk after it and do according as He has said. So we're going to keep this peace. Get, hey, having peace is not, I say, hey, I'll give up my doctrine if me and you can be buddies. No. I'll give you doctrine, and if we can come together over that fellowship, then we can be of one spirit, one mind, and keep that peace. Why am I here striving for peace? I already have it. All right, go with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. This is not one of those chart lessons. This is just hitting the heart of the matter. This is where we live, folks. You understand? All the stuff around you this morning is built on getting you to do something out of your flesh. Listen. Come down the aisle. Get down here in front of me and tell me and the Lord how bad you were last week. Did anybody ever go there? Maybe you got some stuff you just need to get off your heart this morning. Bring it down here and leave it at the altar. How does that happen? When you got up, you know what was with you? Your carnal flesh. You could have laid down there in a coma. Got up six months later, you know what would have been with you? Your nasty flesh. Leave it at the altar. What altar? (laughs) Well, the altar of God. The altar of God was the cross for us. He laid it on the altar. He laid it on the altar for me. Right? Right? So there's a place now I need to go down and confess everything bad I did. See how we've all been misled? Donnie getting off beat. No, I'm not. Stay with me. I promise we'll put it together. Watch here. Back over to Ephesians. Watch, watch my piece right here. Look at verse 14. For He is our peace. Where's your peace coming from, folks? Who have made both one. Notice that, One. And have broken down that middle wall petition between us. You see that reconciliation right there. See what he did? Broke it all down that we might have peace with God. And not only do we have the peace with God, go with me to uh, Philippians. We have peace with God, but we can have the peace of God. And this is where the world right now, there's some saved people who have not the peace of God. They are on edge, man. Their life right now is like somebody running their fingers over a chalkboard. They're edgy. They're nervous. They're confused. They're, they're all this stuff. And you don't have to be. You don't have to be. Nobody's perfect, folks, in this life. But you don't have to be. 
This, this peace that Paul is talking about and the unity that we have, peace can come from it when we respond to God's word correctly. Look at verse 8 of uh, Philippians chapter 4. Finally, brethren, who's Paul writing to? Believers. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. That's a renewing of the mind, right? Think on that. Now watch verse 9. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and also what? Seen in me, says Paul, do and the God of peace shall be with you. Paul said, think, right? Have that knowledge, have that understanding, have that doctrine. And he said, the things that you've learned and you've seen in me, now do them. Well, we don't get to see Paul physically, but we can see what Paul was doing, right? The spiritual mind can say that's what Paul was doing. Let me do that, and he said, and the God of peace be with you. Look back at verse 7 of the same chapter. Look at verse 6 first. Be careful for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication, thanksgiving, and let your request be known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There's God keeping something for you, right? But what do you got to do? You got to fix your mind on what we've been teaching, right? So this mystical will of God that's out there in the world and the world's teachings, there's no need for us to have a mystical mind about what God's doing. God has made it clear. I'm going to finish up on this. The hope of your calling, we've already started this list here. Ambassador, that's the first thing, you become an ambassador. Your calling is to be in a foreign country, okay? Your spirit is here, you're here, you're not in your country. Your home is not this earth. And people are making it that way, but it's not. You're an ambassador. And your charge and your call is to deliver the gospel to lost people. All right? Look over at 1 Timothy. Look at uh, chapter 2. I exhort therefore, verse 1, that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So ambassadors with the gospel, and then what? Bring them all to the truth, right? See the word knowledge? The knowledge of truth. What body of truth is Paul talking about? That which was given unto him. Okay? Okay. I heard a preacher say that that's backwards, that those verses ought to be reversed. He said, first you've got to come to the knowledge of truth, and then the gospel. No, no, no. See, there's a man that's blind, not understanding. The simple truth of the gospel will save you. Then you've got to come learn. You've got to get sound doctrine, knowledge, understanding, and application. The knowledge, come to the knowledge of truth. That's our job. Okay? It's not just my job. It's your job to help others. Okay? Understanding, 1 Corinthians, the last verse we're going to look at, and then we'll stop and we'll answer any questions. We're going to have to have a follow-up message because I didn't touch the verses, all of them that I wanted to touch. 1 Corinthians.
keep your mind on this calling. Walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called. Right? We've been dealing with it for four weeks. Probably going to deal with it a couple more. Look here at verse 26. Chapter 1, 1 Corinthians, verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, Paul's talking to believers, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are what? Are called. They're not called unto this ambassadorship. Why? Because they will not follow the simple message and pattern that God has laid out from His wisdom. They have to rely on their own wisdom. That's why when you're watching television ministries, listening to radio ministries, it always goes back to how smart the preacher is. God says not many of those are called. Okay? They are wise according to the flesh, professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. The message of the gospel is simple. Children can understand it. Children can be taught that they were born a sinner. They need a savior. That Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, shed his blood for their sin, rose again the third day to justify them freely of all their sin forever. They can believe that until somebody taints their mind. Until somebody complicates it out of his own fleshly wisdom and says, no, you got to do A and B and C and D and E. And the list goes on and on. And now you've got a generic gospel that will not save. And if I can believe Paul in Galatians chapter 1, let him be accursed. Let him be cut off from God. It would be better that he were cut off so that he don't continue to do what? To teach bad doctrine. To destroy the work of the cross in which Jesus Christ is the power of salvation to all of us who believe. Get it in your mind. It ain't about a thing that you can do out of your flesh. It's about what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. A child can see that. And if you take that child, as we have witnessed from a family back here this morning, and you put them in correct doctrine, they eventually can learn and come to the knowledge of the truth through correct doctrine. Just as if you take them and put them in a Mormon church, they can learn that corruption. They can learn how to die and go to hell out of their flesh. You say, well, that's harsh. No, it's not harsh. It might be hard, but it's not harsh. It's the truth. To keep the unity of the Spirit, to walk as we walk together, to keep that unity in the bond of peace. Jesus Christ is my peace. Jesus Christ is, it was said here last weekend, my everything. You can make it about brick and mortar. You can make it about curb appeal. You can make it about some flashy teacher that's got doctor before his name and a bunch of letters after his name. But everything to me is in Jesus Christ. Everything to me is in the Savior. Everything to me is in his work. Everything to me is in his accomplishments, not mine. Everything to me is in the blood that was shed to take away my sin forever. You can make it about feeling good. You can make it about emotionalism. I make it all about Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you, since doing that, I've been liberated. I've been set free. I've been delivered from the bondage and the shackles of denominationalism, of trying to make myself better to get Jesus Christ to love me. He loved me when I was yet a sinner. While I was ungodly, without due strength, He died for me. This walk, when you get that understanding, what happens is a fellowship. This room becomes about what? Each one in here, about Jesus Christ. You know what the religious person won't do? They won't have it. Because they've got to have some input. The ones that have stayed, is because you want it to be about Jesus. You know what you've recognized? There's nothing good in you that is in your flesh. You know that. That's why you keep coming back. Right? Something has set your soul free to say, hey, that's a great message. I realize I can't perform. And God says, I've done it all for you. All right? We'll continue the next time. Let's go off camera this morning. We'll take some questions right before departing.
and you're still going to beat everybody else to Bojangles. All right, getting you out of here this morning at 1130. That's not bad. Fed you a little bit this morning. Let us pray before we go off the, the camera. You go ahead and kill the Facebook Live and we'll, we'll pray right before we go off camera this morning. Father, we're so grateful for another day, another opportunity, another day of your grace to teach from the Word of God, to fellowship, to come together, Lord, as one body. Lord, even though we be many members, that we all have come together of the fellowship of God's Word, rightly divided, lifting up our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, holding up the head of the church, one spirit with Him, Lord, are we? Yes, we are. We thank you for that. We give you praise for everything we are in Jesus Christ, what you have made us. All the honor and all the glory goes to the Son of God. We love Him, thank Him, and praise Him. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone did say, Amen. Amen.